Over the 70 years that commercial whaling occurred in the Antarctic, starting around the 1900s, two million large baleen whales were removed from the Antarctic marine ecosystem. Whilst not back up to pre-commercial whaling numbers, it is looking positive for whales found in Antarctic waters, whose numbers have been increasing for a few years now due to the ban on commercial whaling. It was assumed that once commercial whaling stopped, the krill population would increase rapidly. However, this did not happen. Even though the populations of other animals which prey on krill, such as seabirds, fish and other marine mammals, remained stable or even declined, the population of krill biomass declined by more than 80% on the former whaling grounds of the southwest Atlantic sector of the Southern Ocean. So when there were many more whales around, there were also a lot more krill around than there are today. This phenomenon actually has a name. It is called the krill paradox. But why would having less predation increase the number of krill? For this, we need to look at what the krill eat, which is phytoplankton. Basically, very small plants which are carried by the ocean currents. Like all plants, they need nutrients in order to grow well. One of these nutrients is iron. It is needed for plants to synthesize chlorophyll and it is essential for the maintenance of chloroplast structure and function. In roughly a third of all the ocean on the planet, iron is so low that it hinders the growth of phytoplankton. The Southern Ocean is particularly low on iron and it has been known for many years that the amount of phytoplankton that can grow there is limited by the iron concentration in the upper water column. A fascinating paper published in November 2021 discussed the amazing effect of baleen whale poo on ecosystems. Baleen whale's primary source of food is krill and what goes into a whale must come out. The awesome thing about whale poo is that it contains high concentrations of iron which effectively fertilise the upper water column enhancing the production of phytoplankton, which are then fed upon by krill. So the krill numbers go up, which is good news for any whale that consumes krill. Whale faeces is fairly liquid and less dense than seawater, and so it floats to the surface as plumes. Whales are the primary species that fertilise phytoplankton and distribute iron around the oceans during their long migration routes, while sea currents and eddies distribute and mix the nutrients further. Scientists have estimated that the deaths of a few million whales due to commercial whaling deprived the oceans of hundreds of millions of metric tonnes of poo, about 12,000 metric tonnes of iron, and a lot of plankton, krill and fish. Besides fertilising the oceans, the faeces can be analysed to find out all kinds of things about a whale, such as their stress state, if they are sexually mature, what they are eating and how much, the amount of pollution in their environment, if they have any parasites or diseases, whether they are pregnant and how far along they are with the pregnancy and even things about their genetic makeup. They can even identify individual whales. The faecal sample is collected with a net or a jar on a stick, a great non-invasive method. Something I found very amusing is that some scientists use dogs to smell out the poo as it is difficult to see at a distance. There is an interesting theory that if the concentration of iron could be increased in the surface waters of the ocean, that the number of phytoplankton would also increase and that this could help reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Phytoplankton, like all plants, carry out photosynthesis which takes carbon dioxide from the air and turns it into glucose to be used in respiration or stored as starch or other molecules that contain carbon. Phytoplankton that are not eaten die and sink into the deep water as marine snow, taking its stored carbon with it. Along the way, some of the carbon is eaten by marine life and some is chemically broken down, but much of it is carried into deep waters where it can remain for hundreds to thousands of years. If this didn't happen, the earth would be even warmer than it is today. So if we could somehow increase the production of phytoplankton, perhaps that would help decrease atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. This theory has been around for many years, even when I was completing my PhD on Antarctic marine phytoplankton, which was nearly 30 years ago. And scientists have actually been testing the theory out by seeding some areas of the world's oceans with iron. In December 2021, a team of scientists in Australia pumped 300 litres of simulated whale poo into the ocean of Sydney, 
in an area 225 square kilometres of port botany. Previous water sampling had shown that this area is deficient in nutrients. The artificial poo was formulated by a fertiliser company to match the deficiencies in nutrients found at the test site. The poo was mixed with a dye so that a drone could monitor how it dispersed and was an equivalent amount to two humpback whales pooing. The results were encouraging. To be successful, the fake poo needed to stay in the top 20 to 30 metres for at least a day, and it did. Further scaled up trials are planned for this year in the same area and another area off Western Australia. Suitable sites are also being looked at along whale migration routes of other countries. There is also an international project which is planning to carry out experiments this year. They may in fact be underway already. Artificial whale poo is going to be added to an area off the coast of India in the hope of boosting fish populations and tackling climate change. Two options for the artificial whale faeces is iron-rich sand or volcanic ash. The material will be loaded onto rafts of baked rice husks which will enable the material to be carried on the sea surface. For simulated whale poo to be a method of reducing atmospheric carbon, it would need to be conducted on a large scale. A lot of research needs to be completed to make sure that this method does not damage the marine environment. But it does simulate a process which is already happening in nature and has done so for millions of years, so many scientists are hopeful. However, some scientists are concerned about whether this method would actually work to reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide. In December 2021, a report was released by the US National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, summarising the potential risks and benefits of a range of ocean-based methods to remove and store carbon dioxide. The report said that there was a medium to high confidence that adding nutrients to the ocean to promote phytoplankton growth could be effective and scalable, but there was less confidence about the potential environmental risks of the method on a very large scale there is concern about the potential for undesirable geochemical and ecological consequences. However, as mentioned earlier, the report acknowledges that ocean fertilisation on a large scale would speed up the natural processes that are already happening. So is it worth the risk? Only time will tell. We need time for these experiments to be scaled up and their possible negative impacts to be monitored. The problem is that we're running out of time as confirmed by the latest IPCC report on the mitigation of climate change, which states that even though the growth of greenhouse gas emissions have slowed over the past decade, the global emissions by 2030 exceed the pathways consistent with a 1.5 degree Celsius increase by a large margin. So basically, we don't have much time left to find pathways of further reducing our carbon dioxide output and if possible actually removing some atmospheric carbon dioxide and fertilising the oceans with fake whale poo is potentially an ideal way of doing this. If you enjoyed this video then please like, subscribe and share with your like-minded friends. I'm almost at 10,000 subscribers, it would be amazing if I could reach this on this video.